Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. This evening, my guest will be Judge Charlotte Brown Williams. How you doing, then, Judge? Williams? I'm fine, Mr. Brown, and yourself. Great. I'm. Good. I'm. I'm. I'm honored to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on the show, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about district court. Okay. Well, um, in the judicial system, there are several courts. We start out in the state of North Carolina. The highest court would be the North Carolina Supreme Court. And then the second court would be the North Carolina Court of Appeals. The next court would be the Superior Court and then the district court. The district court handles uh, misdemeanors. We handle family court, juvenile, and civil matters up to $10,000. It can be a little bit more, but that's basically our jurisdiction. Then we have, of course, the magistrates, which is not really a court, but a small claims court. And the magistrates in Mecklenburg County do not have to be lawyers and they hear matters of uh, evictions, real estate evictions. They hear uh, small claims up to $5,000. And then you go to the district court. If you don't, um, if you're not satisfied with the result in the magistrate's court, right. you can appeal it to the district court. I uh, work all of the courts, but I am now scheduled in family court. I'm known as a family court judge. Mecklenburg County is one of the a few counties that have a dedicated family court. Okay. And what all goes on within that, the family court? What all does family court, uh, back in 1994, they started one family, one judge. Okay. So that a judge will handi handle family matters. So if someone files for custody, a divorce okay. from bed and board, alimony, one judge will be assigned that case. Mm -hmm then that judge will hear all of the matters in that family's lives. Okay. So for example, if I do custody, and then someone wants a change of custody, then that same case will come back before me. We handle alimony, equitable distribution, when uh, couples break up and they have to divide their property, the family court judge hears those matters. How challenging is that to be in a situation where you have to select between the family members, you know, as far as what all do they receive and stuff like that? Well, in the instance of uh, child custody, we, we're, we, are, we are governed by the law. We have certain standards by which we um, judge by. A district court judge, a family court judge, has a lot of discretion. But in custody cases, it's the best interest of the child. Correct. But Regardless of the parent situation, I need to do what's best for the child. We need to do what's best for the child. When we're looking at distribu distributing property, we are a state that says everything you acquired during the marriage, regardless of whose name is on it, whether it's a, something you buy in your sole name or it's a debt that you make in your sole name, whatever is done during a marriage is subject to marital distribution. Uh, most of us start off with the 50-50, <laughs> basically, and then you have to show why it should not be distributed equally. Okay, I, I know you mentioned as far as the, um, the child custody issue and stuff. Do you see a lot of the men getting more custody within these cases now? Well, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Many years ago, at least, right. I'm trying to think. I started practicing in North Carolina in 1991 after coming from New York. I was a securities lawyer in New York. Okay. And so before 1994, um, I can't exactly remember the exact year, but in the early 2000s, used to be that persons would think a woman had um, priority over a child. Correct. But that's not so. The Constitution says there is no presumption that the mother is better or the father is better. There is a presumption that the parents, a constitutional right to custody that parents have over non-parents, such as grandmothers and aunts and such situations like that. But men, 
if you can show a judge that you can, you have provided, you're feeding, you're caring for, you, you can develop that child and you're doing that, then there's no reason why you cannot have custody. And we have a lot of men who have sole custody of their children. And that's a great thing, you know, that guys, are, men are stepping up and taking on that responsibility. I mean, we have a lot of young ladies that I guess have taken that responsibility as well, and I applaud them as well. But I guess for the for the men to actually come up and say, "I'm a father to, to that child," and you know, and you and you take that responsibility and willing to to go with it, that's a great thing. Uh, most of the time, you see in the community, um, particularly in today's environment, uh, so many um, persons who are not married. And young, young parents, young parents. And so typically you'll see a young uh, mother. And the father is somewhat out of the picture, but then he tries to come into the picture. And sometimes the mother kind of just keeps him backed away. You know, he can't get visitation, he can't get this. And I admire those men who come in and they say, I want to visit, I want to be in my child's life. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's ever a time that a man or a woman does not get custody uh, or visitation. You may get supervised if you have some issues, such as drugs, such as neglect. If you don't know right. what to do, you'll get some, but it may be supervised by someone else or DSS or something like that. But I'm always encouraging um, parents to have time with their children. How long have you been a judge and what inspired you to become one? I ran in 2008 and I was very successful here in Mecklenburg County and if I can say receiving 62 percent of the um, vote and so for That's all of great. those who are out here listening to this interview <laughs> I thank you I thank you because I absolutely love what I do. I've always wanted to be a judge. I went to law school late in life. I uh, ran for judge in my 60s. Okay. And um, I had the energy and the temerity and to run, and I, and I did it, and I did it well. And I think the success is because I love people. And I spent many years, uh, tw over 20 years, handling uh, uh, person's problems. I was a lawyer, and I also pastored for 15 years. You did? Ah. <laughs> yes, I'm an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Okay. And I passed it up until I ran for judge. And I think um, in handling, nurturing persons in the church, handling persons' legal problems in my law practice gave me much, much experience. Because district court, unlike the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, handle matters of law. They don't see people. Correct. I see people on a daily basis. I see people who commit crimes because they commit crimes. I see people with mental challenges, substance abuse challenges, young people who have never been properly trained up, Correct. Uh, families that are in disharmony. The same things that I saw as a pastor, same things that I saw as a a uh, practicing lawyer. And what I always uh, saw myself as doing is being fair and impartial. The courthouse, the courtroom, is for the public. And when you come to court, you should not fear. You should expect to be treated fairly, a judge to listen to you, and rule. Now, on a criminal matter, it doesn't always mean that you don't go to jail. That's true. That may be the consequences of the action. When I have sent people to jail, they almost thanked me because they knew <laughs> that they had their, I've given them as many chances as possible for them to turn their lives around. Why is there such a big issue about recidivism? Be because I think for two reasons, maybe more than that. Number one, in district court, and I remember the court watched people being in court about a year or so ago, and I explained to them, district court handles misdemeanors misdemeanors are lesser than felonies. Felonies more serious. Correct. We have structured sentencing in North Carolina. 
I have a grid. Your level one, level two, level three, class one, class two, class three, A1. The maximum sentence, jail time, active sentence that you can get for a crime with A1, which would be assault on a female, is 150 days. For a larceny, 120 days. That's four months. That means you can come, come out, steal, go back in, come out, steal, go back in, until the person decides that they wish to change. They're going to steal and come back. We're not, we don't have the ability to put someone one to, and send someone to prison for two years. And you see a lot of mental challenges and substance abuse. And so people are committing crimes and then committing crimes. And so recidivism is very, very high. And until someone driving, if you speed, you speed. Correct. How many speeding tickets are you going to get before you stop speeding? So your license is taken from you. You have to want to stop. And how, I mean, how much does the, do you feel that the economy have on that are repeating the same offense? Well, as I say to some defendants who are standing in front of me, I hear the sad stories. I heard them all week. I don't work. I haven't worked. I mean, I understand that, but that does not justify stealing. Correct. It's hard, and, and, and what happens is that once you have a criminal record, the ability to obtain employment is difficult. And so you see a cycle. Correct. But as you know, someone can get off of a cycle if they really, really want to, with some help. And so we often send people to resources. We have many resources. We send uh, persons without um, high school diplomas to programs. Central Piedmont Community College has a GED program. We send people to programs such as Pathways and ECHO to try to get people t back into the community working, looking for a job, getting their resumes so that they do not have to resort to criminal activity. There's no excuse in my mind. And um, I had Sheriff Bailey on the show, and um, I know they have a lot of outstanding programs for the individuals that's incarcerated at Jail Central. How important is it for that individual to want to get into these programs, to want a change in life? Very. I don't believe anyone can change until they want to. I'm not, uh, I've, I've never been, I've been, fortunate not to have issues. I do drink coffee and I can't stop drinking coffee. <laughs> it's hard to not drink coffee. If I stop drinking coffee, I get a headache. So I understand somewhat addictions, mm -hmm. <laughs> but at some point you have to exercise self-control, but it's hard to do it by yourself. That's why those programs are so important because you have someone to walk by your side someone in front of you guiding you, someone on your side helping you along, and then you have the rest of us pushing you. We want people to succeed. We want people to be employed. I do child support court. I want parents to pay. And I, the cycle, and it's just, I see people who can't get work, then they commit crimes, and then it's harder and harder. And I'll say it's hard, but nothing is impossible. Look, I went to law school at 43. Most people say, that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. You do it. You try it. What drives <laughs> Judge Williams to continue to move on in the judicial system and in life? One, uh, for being a judge, I absolutely love it. For me, um, I'm up for re-election um, in 2012. Okay. I have only one more term that I can serve because judges uh, must retire at the age of 72. And so I hope you can say you don't look it. You don't. But uh, you don't. You <laughs> I um, will, uh, if I'm fortunate enough to uh, win another term, yes, 
then I'll retire, but I live life every day. I'm on my next projects. I want to write books. Since I've passed it, I preach. I'm writing a book of sermons. I'm writing devotionals. I'm writing a book about how to win a campaign. Okay. And so I just think that you never stop learning, growing, and developing. How important is it to have that drive to want to live life to the fullest? I think for me it's very important. Now I'm, uh, people would tease me and say I'm, I'm sort of hyperactive. Okay. I'm, I'm um, nonstop movement. Correct. Um, I hail from New York, that's no excuse, but they say sometimes that is an excuse. I'm just a, a person who loves life. I just feel there are many, many things. I had a child young. I went to school at night for a long time. My life uh, was just one of hard work. And so I want to travel and do things that I didn't get to do while I was in school and working. And there are people to see, meet, and places to go. Being a judge, I know it had to have been hard moving. How, what all obstacles did you have to face, you know what I'm saying? Because I know there's always challenges in life. What would be considered your biggest obstacle you had to face in life? One, um, because I've done so many different Correct. things. I, I say I'm sort of a jack of all trades. Okay. Ma you, you know, when you do a lot, you never, uh, you don't master any one thing. Mastery right. is important. But for a judge, um, if you've never been a judge, you can't say you have that experience until you get on the bench. Correct. But the sum total of your legal, my legal practice, my pastoring, my job experiences, I bring, that comes to bear on what I do. I think the obstacle, the biggest obstacle was I was not really necessarily from Mecklenburg. I wasn't born in North Carolina and not from Mecklenburg. I, I pastored outside of Mecklenburg. So I think I had to really uh, win over, if you will, or gain the respect of the lawyers who had to come before me because they didn't really know me. Okay, as far as I know, how hard is it or difficult is it to become a judge? Well, first you have to be a lawyer. Okay. Uh, interestingly enough, North Carolina does not have a minimum number of years of practice. Mm -hmm. I think we should. I think the legislature should at least have five years. You can come out of law school and run for judge or be appointed a judge. And so there's two ways to uh, be a judge. One, if there's a vacancy on the bar and uh, vacancy on the bench, the local bar sends three names to the governor and the governor selects one person to be a judge. That's an appointment. The other is the way I did it. There was an open seat, meaning the judge, which would be my, uh, which would be my seat okay. in 2016. If I am fortunate enough to be on the bench, then I would not file for re-election on the year that I have to retire. That means my seat is open, and those who seek to be a judge can file for my seat. Mm -hmm. So you have to file, and then you run. And um, I enjoyed. <laughs> running for election because I'm a people person. I did street ministry in New York and so I don't meet strangers. I don't meet strangers and that's a gift that I have that allows me a little bit of success that a lot of people don't have. Judges are smart conservative people basically. Uh, you, you wonder how some of us have won elections because they're real conservative <laughs> and um, Sometimes they look at me, how did you do it? Well, it's, it's my, it's what I did. It's what I've always done. And so that helped me. When you see a lot of our youth getting into the criminal activity, how does that make you feel? Uh, sad. <laughs> I've done juvenile detention and I've, talk to some of the uh, most hardened ones. I, I could never believe that a child could be so hard. I used to uh, go into the classrooms, my friends who were teachers, I would go and do 
speak to classes, okay. kindergartners, and I see children with bright eyes, bright eyes. Then I see later on that light gone out, and I wonder what happened. Oftentimes I'm in court with the juveniles, there's no parent there. As a pastor, former pastor, I talk to my colleagues, what are we doing? What are we doing? Train up a child. <laughs> if you don't train up a child and there's no restraint, you get what you see. And I'm saddened because I don't believe a child sets out to be like that. Environment plays a large role. How much would you place that on the parents and the, the people and the, the adults in the community? All of it. All of it. A at one time when I was coming up, <laughs> the community was responsible for the child. Right. I can remember my parents worked. I would be considered a latchkey kid. I could not go out of my house wearing certain things Correct. because before I got to the school bus or the neighborhood school, my mother, who's a nurse, was called. And before I got to school, she was there. Mm. So we looked, <laughs> we looked out for each other. So many of the young parents, I mean, people worked, my parents worked. This is a different generation and they weren't fortunate enough to stay home, but when you're home, you have to pay attention to the children. They have to be trained. You can't leave them on their own, looking at television. You're in one room, never reading a book to them. Never going up to the school and seeing about them. I do truancy court. We make the parents come every Monday. The parents have to come. And I see the difference in the children when the parents are paying attention every day to their homework, to their meeting with their teachers and seeing that they're getting to school. The grades have gone from F to A. So yeah, that tells me, you invest in your child and your child will perform successfully. And do you feel that's what, one of the things that we're missing? I mean, because you have a lot of the communities whereas the neighbors don't even know each other and we try to, I mean, we stay out of each other's business and you think that's one of the key things that we need to start getting more into? And if I had a perfect world that I could do it, I, when I pastor, that's what the community of, that I pastor, the church that I pastor, that is a community of like-minded believers. And we share, that's the idea of community. You're not walking alone. If you don't have food, I help you, I feed you. Okay. If you don't have a job, I help you find one. That's community. And I, I think if, until we get to a better feeling that we are each other's keeper in a way, It'll be like it is. I don't know. I don't know. I think people are afraid. You're right, because I can remember um, a teacher telling me that if she said something to the parent, then the parent's going to come up into the school and the teachers are now afraid of the parent. Well, that shouldn't be. And so in a sense, if you're afraid to say something, if you, I want to say something positively to, uh, positive to your child, and then I'm going to get you <laughs> talking negative to negative to me, it probably, with some people, it, would stop, it wouldn't stop me because I'm still going to still be positive to your I'm child. Sure. <laughs> what does the phrase positive thinking creates positive results? What does that mean to you? Think on these things. Whatsoever thing is pure, mm -hmm. what has virtue. Uh, positive generates positive energy to me. There's an energy that says I can. I'm a positive person. I believe, I believe that I can do anything that I set my mind to. The question is, do I want to go through what I have to go through to get it? Do I want to do the work for it? And can I exercise the self-control to get there? So I'm going to speak positive. When I say positive, I'm going to look at a situation. Oh, if a child comes to detention and they can't be good, they can't do, there's a list of they don't do this. Instead of me saying, don't do this, I say, you can be friendly. There are some things that I know. That you can pick up your books. You can get up one time. And you come back and you show me you did these three things, 
then I'm going to let you have it. And lo and behold, that child will do those three things. I don't tell them not to do something. I tell them what I believe they can do and give them a sense of success. Because when you do something and you succeed in it, then you can believe you can do it again. What is one thing in life that you have never done that you really want to do? I want to answer that on television. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Something that I, um, well, I want to go to, um, I've been to South Africa. I would love to go to uh, Egypt and Israel. I'd love to, and I'd like to walk um, Greece. I'd like to do the Paul's missionary journey trip. Oh, okay. Judge Brian William, um, it was an honor having you on the show, and anytime you want to come back, you're more than welcome. Well, Please thank you back. so much for having me and giving me this opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we do. Thank you. Audience, thank you for watching the show. Go on the website, www.paulandbrown.webs.com. And until we meet again, you be encouraged. Thank you.